level 16 and uh, we're going to basically try and camp over there for a little bit Samuel's first Samuel chapter 16 We've been moving from Genesis and looking at God and his story so far and how his story plays out in, in our lives. And uh, we've been looking at book by book as, as far as we can, we can pick up those pearls of wisdom that we find in Scripture. Last Sunday we uh, looked at the book of Ruth and we were in that period of Judges. And now we're finding ourselves moving away from the book of Judges. And this Sunday we're going to look at and talk about King David. Uh, we're going to look at the first half of David's life today. And next week we're going to look at the second part of his life. And we're going to find that we, we will wrestle with the question this morning of why is God favors uh, um, David over Saul because Saul was the first king of Israel but I didn't say we're going to talk about Saul I said we're going to talk about David and it seems as if God has this special favor towards David which is far exceeding that of Saul the story that we're going to look at takes place in um, the, the place in Israel which if you remember a while back I said to you the best way to look at the, at the geography of Israel the best way to remember the geography of Israel is the bacon uh, strips the five bacon strips remember and the two bones at the, one at the top one at the bottom with the lettuce tomato and whatever you're wanting to uh, to put in, into your burger okay and I said it's quite odd telling you that the way best way to describe the geography of Israel is to do with bacon okay uh, it's not very kosher is it but if you remember those five strips of bacon are those five different geographical sort of um, things within Israel okay uh, this story happens between the coastal plain and the Judea mountain plain okay and remember there is a name to that place between the two plains to remember what it was a lot of things happened in that area okay you don't remember none of you remember it was such an earth-shattering uh, experience that sermon that you are remembering it so well right you probably remember the bacon part but not the next part okay the next part is basically that area is called the Shefela. do you remember the Shefela? okay where God's people meet the pagan world was in the Shefela. Gideon's problems uh, were in the Shefela. okay uh, um, and we see a lot of the story that were happening in the Shefela. okay it's, it's so much so that people came up with this phrase how is your Shefela? how is your lowland how are you doing when you're engaging with people uh, for God how is your shefala do you look like the Philistines in your day-to-day -day engagement with people or do you look like the Israelites in your day-to-day -day engagement with people how is your shefala the question we ask is does God want a king does God want a king does he want Israel to have a king? Because remember, in the book of Judges, they were ruled by judges. Well, if we look at Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 to 15, George, if you can put it on the screen, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 to 15, When you enter the land, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, 
and have taken possession of it and settling in it remember we were talking about them taking possession of the land it meant that each tribe had a portion and remember uh, two weeks ago or before uh, before I was on leave for a while remember we spoke about how you should engage with your portion you'll be happy with your portion the tribe of Dan didn't they were not happy with the portion God gave them and so there were problems in there well here it says as you take possession and settle in this land and you say let us set a king over us like all the nations around us okay because every other nation had some kind of a king be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses he must be from among your fellow Israelites do not place a foreign uh, a foreigner over you one who is not an Israelite so does God want them to have a king yes but what was the criteria of the king pick the one that I will choose for you essentially they wanted a king because everyone else had a king so what did they do they pick Saul because he saw the scripture says was head and shoulder above, above everyone else he looked the part maybe he spoke the part but he didn't walk the walk did he and he stands out about among the men as someone who would be a good pick for the king but did God choose Saul to be a king no so they pick Saul and it doesn't work out well does it and you'd have to read the whole of first and second Samuel to to see that it didn't work out well for Saul surprise of all surprises when you pick the one that you want and not the one that God wants guess what happens guess what happens Saul gets rejected as king by his own people and Samuel I love that about him I love that about Samuel he doesn't get into Paul's face and shakes his finger at Paul and says well I told you so okay he doesn't do that Samuel actually the scripture says mourned for Saul apparently he mourned for a long time because in the passage that we're going to read we see an interesting thing and we're going to read from 1st Samuel 16 verse 1 so George if you can put that the Lord said to him Samuel how long will you mourn for Saul since I God have rejected him as king over Israel fill your horn with oil and be on your way I'm sending you to Jesse or Bethlehem I have chosen one of his sons to be a king and so he goes to Jesse's house and he says to Jesse I've come to choose the king God has chosen a king and God has told me to come to your house because one of your sons is going to be a king so Jesse gathers his son okay his sons and he presents them one by one and the first one probably looks quite the part of being a king a nice big muscular kind of guy and God says to Samuel no nah, that's not the one and so he presents to him the other son probably was well spoken looked after he, the way he looks and he probably thinks well this is going to be the king of Israel and God says to Samuel no nah, that's not the one and eventually he goes through all the sons and the answer God says to Samuel that's not the one and I can imagine Samuel looking at Jesse and saying, well have you got any other sons <laughs> you mean David <laughs> David is out with the sheep he's a shepherd boy you really want me to call David yeah if you got another son and that's David that's who I want you to call because God says one of your sons clearly these are not them so if you got another son call him and David comes from the, sh 
the, 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 the field with the sheep is probably dirty and sweaty and you know David was a short guy he wasn't of big status or, or stature or anything like that the scripture actually says that he was ruddy with blemish he was probably a redhead with a lot of frinkles on okay yay for those who have frinkles you are a king material yay Woo. okay and he says him well yeah it's jesse and i can imagine samuel looking at jesse at, at david and going mm. and god says that's the king you see when others see a shepherd boy god see a, sees a king doesn't he god sees a king when others look and see a shepherd boy and so what happens is he, he takes his horn and it literally is a horn a okay, ram's horn that is filled with oil in those days that didn't when they anointed someone it wasn't just a little drop making a cross they literally poured oil glug 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 onto the person and say okay you anointed and everyone who witnessed it realized that that person was anointed and chosen by god and, 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 and he does it very differently and so anoints David with pouring him, drenching him in oil. I can imagine David thinking, what is happening here? You know? And God picks David. But why does God pick David to be the king? Well, let's have a look at 1 Samuel 17 verse 1 to 3. Now the Philistines... Where are they? Now the Philistines, who are they? Now the Philistines, well, what are they doing there? Hey? Gathered the forces for war and assembled at Sukkot in, Jew in Judah. The pitch camp at Ephraim's Mamin between Sukkot and Azaka. So and the Israelites assembled and kept in the valley of Elah and drew up the battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Now I want to show you, okay, because I know you've got an imagination, but I want to help your imagination. I want you to show you a picture of, of Elah. This is a valley of Ella, okay? And, and we standing, okay, we as, as, as us, we are standing on the one hill, okay, which the Israelite stood on. And what you are looking at is the other hill where the Philistines stood on, okay? And behind them, you'll see the sea, okay? So this is the, this is the Shephelah, okay? And the one mountain is one of those bacon strips that I was speaking to you about, the coastal plain where you can see the sea behind it and where we standing on this hill is the other bacon strip which is the Judean uh, um, mountains okay and in between there is what is known as the Ella uh, Valley okay and um, it's, it's, it's quite cool when you go there because you see it for yourself now whether the battle actually took place there or not we're not quite a hundred percent sure because there were no any archaeological uh, finding in that area but uh, from the names of the names that are mentioned in the Bible those names are still here okay they're still available they're still those are their little towns in those places so we can surmise that that's where it is and if you don't believe me well come and join me next year in March where we're going to go to Israel on a tour so start saving okay around the 20th of march we will be going to israel so start saving okay so so this is basically where they are now why are the philistines there well remember what happened with dan they were not content with their portion and so dan literally took place and they went right up to to the north of israel okay sort of where the problems are at the moment between israel and syria and iraq and stuff like that dan is in that area very isolated from the, all the other tribes they moved away as they moved away the philistines came in 
okay, and to camp on this valley, okay, with the, with the mountains um, and behind them the sea, because the Philistines were known as sea people, okay. So every day this guy Goliath, okay, comes to the middle of the field, okay, he comes from that mountain and he comes down to the middle of the field and he begins to taunt the Israelites. And he does it twice a day, the scripture says, twice a day. The NIV will say in the morning and in the afternoon. Now, why do you think he does it in the, around those times? In the morning and afternoon. Because those are the times around which the Israelites do their daily sacrifices and their daily prayer to God. Okay? And in a way... Goliath stands there and he taunts them and he says, you want him to listen to you with your sacrifices, well he's not going to listen to you. And Goliath is not just saying to them, you guys are chicken, okay, but you guys, your God is worthless. Because look at you, you're sacrificing, you're praying to him twice a day. And what does he do? Nothing. Your God is worthless. If your God is worth remembering in your prayers and sacrifices, if that is your God, then send one God to me to fight against me. Come on, one on one. Eyeball to eyeball. Come on. But you're too scared, aren't you? Chicken. <laughs> Come on, what kind of a God is that? Surely he can equip one of you to, to, to fight with me? Now I want to introduce you to a very important Hebrew concept here. And that is the word Kadush Hashem. Can you say Kadush Hashem? Now it means hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Kadush Hashem is what God's people are called. And this idea is really important in the mind of the Israelite. Because they are called to be a kingdom of priests. Therefore you must bring honor to his name. Jesus, when his disciple asked him how to pray, what does he say? Our Father, Lord in heaven... Hallowed, Kadush Hashem. Hallowed is your name. Kadush Hashem. This is central to the Jewish mind in that day. That if we are going to be God's people, then we have to be people who bring honor to His name, who hallowed His name, who Kadush His name. And Goliath is not just taunting the Israelites and calling them cowards. He calls them out on a fundamental principle of following the God. Are you going to let me make fun of you and your God? Or are you going to Kadush Hashem, your God, and then send someone, come on, to fight me? And what we see is David comes there, it says that he came to bring lunch to his brothers, I don't know. But David comes there and David's brothers are just standing there. And, 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 and he says, well, what, what are you guys doing? Just standing there. Are you going to let him do that? Are you going to not Kadush Hashem? I mean, what are you guys going to Where is Saul? Where is our king? I mean, he's a man among men. He's a man that stands tall about other men. Where is our king? Who should be fighting him? That? The king. I mean, Saul is that man, is he not? And David comes to him and he says to Saul, he says, I'm going to fight him. And I can imagine Saul looking at David and saying, You? You're going to fight this guy? I mean, look at you, David. Aren't you a shepherd? Didn't I, didn't I see you in the fields with the sheep? Are you going to fight this guy? And David says, yes, I, I, I'm going to fight him. Because I can do Shashem. 
I hallowed the name of God, of my God. And I'm not going to stand here and listen to him going on about our God. Saul puts his armor on David. Now I want you to try and imagine this. Saul is like, uh, I've picked on you last time I think, didn't I? Yes, I did. Saul is like Ryan. Just stand up. Uh, this is going to be an amazing demonstration. Saul is like Ryan. And David is like Dina. Okay. Can you see the difference? Mr. and Mrs. Peterson, sit down. They're newlyweds, by the way. I see. Yeah. I, that's how I can pick on them. <laughs> can you see the difference? Can I, and I'm going to use it, and I don't want to embarrass you, but if Dina had to wear one of Ryan's shirts... It's going to be quite big, okay? And probably very uncomfortable, okay? Has any of you had children wear your, uh, your clothes, okay? I remember Ben likes to wear my shirts and he likes to wear my shoes and he looks absolutely ridiculous, okay? So imagine, picture that and Saul says to David, okay, David is a shepherd boy. He has minimal amount of, of sort of like layers of clothes so he can be fast if he has to chase uh, a wild animal, okay, and he puts on his armor on him, okay. Can you imagine what David looks like? Okay, <laughs> walking there with his armor, where's the sword? Where, where did I put the sword? You know, and sort of like try to look for the sword. And David says, No, 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 move that. I don't need that. Okay, he goes down to the brook and he picks up five stones. Now why did he pick up five stones? Goliath had four brothers. That's what most of us think that. Yeah, that's, that's right. Most, most people think that Goliath had four brothers, but there's no way of really finding out if he did or not. And that is normally the thing that's going around. But I need you to think Jewish for a second. Okay? I need you to a second think the way the Jews would think in that time. Numbers, okay, are not quantitative, but they are qualitative. Okay, so it's not the quantity of the number, but the quality of the number. Okay, David picks up five stones for the same reason that Jesus picks up five loaves to feed the people. And the reason for it is because it represents the word of God to them. How many books are in the Torah? The first, how many books of the Bible? Five. Okay, the first five books of the Old Testament in the Jewish mind were the word of God. The rest was just addition to the word of God by God and by God's people. But the first five, what they're known as the Torah... The five books that Moses wrote were the word of God. Okay? Now, did he actually f pick up five stones or not? Well, I'm not sure, and there's no way of knowing it. But uh, who cares how many stones he picked? That's not the point. The point is that he's making a statement about his agenda. And he says, when I walk out on this field, I'm not just representing me and my, my, my scared brothers who are behind me and, and the king, wherever the king is, because uh, some people say that the king was not even there. He was in a place called uh, Sheharim, which means the gates, and Sheharim was, was to, to the left of this picture. Okay? The place is still there, and the did find archaeological findings in Sheharim which uh, says that it was a, a place where a king would come and rest and there would be a guard posted outside there. So uh, there is evidence that um, that is still there. But he's saying, I'm going to come to you and I'm representing not everyone else. I'm not even representing myself. I'm representing the name of my God and I will Kadush Hashem hallowed his name that's who I'm representing and he takes the stone 
and he swings it in his sling and he wings it and it hits Goliath between the eyes in the forehead. Now where are we supposed to bind the word of God? We've learned that way back in Genesis. Remember? Bind them to your foreheads. Bind them on your hands. And remember those, t- those black boxes that I showed you a picture of? That they were on the heads. So the religious Jews still wear it. And the word of God is between your eyes, in the center here of your brain, and on this arm, so it's close to your heart. And it hits him right here in the middle. And you can see that as David just swings that sling and, and let that stone go, it just hits him and then he falls. And the scripture says that, and, and in many pictures, Sunday school pictures, we see that this little David is picking up this huge head and his blood just carrying out. Sort of like one of those uh, Game of Thrones type of scene, okay, with all the blood still pouring out. Cool, eh? If you like that that stuff. Okay. And, and, and that's what we see, but I don't know if that's true of David. Because if you're a person who Kadusha Hashem, would you be doing that? You won't be displaying the dead person because traditionally that will defile you as being unclean as well. So I don't know so much about it, but that's not important. But yeah, we see Goliath fall, and we see David was essentially saying, no one will make fun of my God. No one will make fun of my God. God favors David because he's willing to kadush Hashem. He's willing to hallow his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. And we say it, don't we say it in our prayers? Do it, do it. Now there are all kinds of implications to this story for us today, but what I would like to suggest for us this morning is that perhaps one of the things we need to wrestle with is how are we justifying being the Israelite on the hill but talking like David? Because how many times we don't talk like David. I can tell you how many, pe- how many times people say to me, well, you know, I hear what you're saying, whether it is in a counseling situation, whether it's in a debate situation, whether it's in talking to someone about the complexities of the Bible. How many times I hear people say to me, well, I agree with you in principle, but, and then there's whatever the but is, as if there is a difference between principle and practice. God's agenda for our, for our finance? Well, yeah, I agree with you, Lichai, in principle for God's agenda in my finance, but not in practice. What about my relationship? Well, Lichai, I agree with you in principle about God's agenda for my relationship, but not in practice. What about your family? Well, Lichai, I agree with you about my family in principle and what God agenda for my family is, but in practice, I don't know if I agree with that. It's true in principle and in practice, isn't it? It's not, it's not as if it's true in, in principle and it's not true in, in practice. If it's true in principle, then it must be true in practice, doesn't it? No matter what you say or you believe, and there are a lot of Christians out there who walk, who, who talk like David, but act like the Israelites up on the hill, scared. And they say, My giants are, are there, and my God is able to. I've got no doubt that my God is able to. But I'm not willing to step out in faith. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm not willing to step up in faith in my circumstances and Kadush Hashem. Because if you only knew what I'm going through. 
if God only knew what I was going through. Well, he does. And he chooses a David. He chooses you to go through your circumstances. And like David, we have a choice to be like his brothers and like the king, which were scared. Or we have a choice, as David did take that choice, and hallowed his name. And say, I'm sorry, but you're not going to have the last word, Goliath. This giant in my life is not going to control my life for the rest of my life. Because if I, in my daily prayer, said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me my daily bread. Forgive me as I forgive those. And if we are true to the Lord's prayer, then we need to be true in principle and in practice. There should be no difference between pray, practice and principle when it comes to the Lord. The decision to hallow God's name is made long before the moment that you need to do it. David chose to hallow God's name long before he slain Goliath. Long before that. Second Corinthians twelve nine, God's strength is made perfect in what? In weakness. Because you see, when others see a shepherd boy, God sees a king. And why David is favored more than Saul? Because David made himself available. To God. And he says, Take me. I don't need a whole armor. I just need what I know how to use, which is a sling and some stones. But what I do need, God, is to, for you to show up. And as you slain Goliath, let the Israelites who are on this side. Realize that your name is great. And that the Philistines are on that side begin to shake at the sound of your name. If you want God to do great things through you, in you, then you need to begin to hallow his name. You need to live out like people who hallow his name, who kadush. A shame. Amen? Amen. Right. We're going to have another song and then we're going to have another play from our covenant players and then as soon as they say curtain then the offering for the ministry will then be taken. <laughs>